All right, crew, World War II on the home front day. Here's uh, some of the things we're going to talk about. And then, of course, answer the Ed Puzzle uh, video questions as we go through. So how does, uh, how does uh, things change within the, the, the 48 states of the United States when troops go off to war? First, there's pretty much universal approval of the war after uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, the, the vote in the House is 388 to 1. The only person who votes against it is Jeanette Rankin, and she's actually the first ever uh, member of the U.S. House of Representatives that's a female, and she's very much opposed to the war. She actually voted against entrance into World War I also, um, and so she's the only person who dissents, who, who, who doesn't support the war effort. And actually, shortly after she cast the only no vote, um, she gets voted out of office in the next uh, round of elections. So it's, it's pretty much unanimous that the United States is, is supporting the war effort. And then you start to see slogans and songs like junk will win the war, encouraging people to do their part, slap the Jap with scrap, scrap metal, pay your taxes, beat the Axis, the Axis powers. We're going to find a feller who's yeller and we're going to beat him red, white, and blue. Maybe a little bit of uh, um, discriminatory tones there towards the Japanese. Um, your blood will help, encouraging people to donate. To slip of the lip may sink a ship, kind of a recommendation to the idea that there are German Americans who might be more loyal to Germany, Italian Americans who might be more loyal to Italy, or the same thing with Japanese Americans on the West Coast. Is this trip necessary? Rationing off fuel to try to save uh, some of that for the war effort. Buy bonds today. Of course, bonds are loans for the U.S. government to help fund the war effort. You see propaganda posters like this, even Mickey Mouse in the bottom left corner. Uh, you know, uh, the Red Cross encouraging people to join the military. Uh, whether it's the Army or the Navy, right? Loose talk can cost lives. All sorts of examples of uh, everyday people um, trying to, to support the war effort. Uh, here's a really good one. Don't let the shadow touch them by war bonds. Of course, there's that Nazi German swastika hovering over the background, kind of appealing to parents uh, to, to protect future generations in the event that uh, uh, the war would eventually expand from Europe over into uh, North America. Okay. Know your place, shut your face. You can't really say that to anybody nowadays, but uh, that was something that was released by uh, the U.S. government. Uh, again, the idea that uh, there were uh, people within the United States that would have loyalties to their native countries, uh, kind of a reference to America's history as a nation of immigrants here um, and, and making sure you're not you know, spreading news that could be used against you. Uh, we actually have a peacetime draft in 1940. Uh, again, Pearl Harbor doesn't happen until December 7th, 1941, but the United States is prepping, preparing uh, to enter into the war. The writing is on the wall uh, uh, when, when Europe erupts into war in 1939 and then into 1940 with some of the Nazi advances. And so uh, there was preparations to enter into the war, even during a time of peace. You could be rejected from being drafted uh, based off of height, um, uh, weight, mental instability, um, something along those lines could be something that could get you out of the draft. Uh, but we do see four times as many Americans serve in World War II than they served in World War I, 16 million total. Um, and we had a lot of presidents who, you know, for a while it was almost a prere prerequisite. If you were going to become the president of the United States, you had to patriotically serve your country. And you can see we had five presidents who did just that in World War II. Um, the other thing is that the United States really mobilizes both coasts. Uh, obviously, there was war in the Pacific, and so the West Coast was obviously concerned about that. There was war in Europe, and so the East Coast uh, is heavily mobilized in that regard. Um, and one of the kind of the black eyes, or you could say civil rights violations during World War II, uh, is that Japanese Americans were were relocated, forcefully relocated to some of these areas on the map here, uh, and they were put into internment camps. Uh, the concern by a lot of Americans and the U.S. government was that there would be more loyalty to the native um, Japan in the event of a West Coast invasion uh, than there would be to, uh, to the United States. And so uh, a lot of those Japanese Americans were, were given uh, you know, as little as 48 hours to pack up their stuff, and they were forcefully relocated into one of those camps. Those camps were not exactly desirable places. Uh, 125,000 Americans are relocated because of Executive Order 9066, signed by um, 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, uh, just three months after Pearl Harbor. And uh, it really shows kind of the hysteria that took over. And uh, because of that, some of the civil rights violations that ob obviously happened. And, and one of the real downfalls is once the war does end, a lot of those Japanese Americans went back to San Francisco or Los Angeles or the West Coast and, and found that their, their place of, of residence or business was taken over or bulldozed or um, uh, basically forcing them to start anew and fresh. And so we see a lot of discrimination um, because of that Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, on the left here is uh, a wartime posting instructing all Japanese uh, citizens to, to be forced to relocate. And you can see some of the discrimination here in businesses and in neighborhoods. Um, the U.S. government certainly didn't do much to, to help protect Japanese Americans because they were trying to, to mobilize support for the war and, and really paint the enemy as a, in a real negative tone. And so um, you start to see you know, propaganda posters like this that, uh, that really are meant to mobilize support and paint the enemy in a real negative light. Okay? Um, there are some major medical advances that, that help save large numbers of troops. Um, um, some antibiotics like penicillin that are still around today. Plasma, of course, is a, is a common treatment today. And so we end up seeing the infection rate go way down uh, because of some of these advances. And 97% of those servicemen end up staying alive, a much higher survival rate than during World War I. Uh, we also see uh, discrimination in the military ranks. There was, there was no integration of troops, uh, integration of the races in the Marines. There, there was only minimal amounts of integration in the Navy. And the Army at this point in time segregated units. There was all white units and there was all black units. It's not till 1948, three years after World War II, where we see the integration of the military. And so, you know, on one hand, the United States is fighting for democracy and freedom around the world. But on the other hand, uh, kind of hypocritical that it's not being extended to all members of American society at this point in time. Uh, the Red Cross even went as far to segregate plasma from uh, white and black donors uh, during that point in time, okay? Um, women played a big role in the war. About 250,000 women actually served in the military. Uh, there was actually marriage rates that soared also. There was a group, uh, or the nickname was, was given, they were called allotment annies. And if you married a, a serviceman, uh, you would get that $50 a month uh, service. And so that was something a lot of uh, you know, young couples, high school, college age couples had to decide was, do they get married or do they wait with the idea that maybe uh, the husband or the, the fiance wouldn't come back from war? And then, you know, now you kind of hear of these Dear John letters, those kind of originated with, with uh, you know, women sending these letters off to men uh, uh, overseas. And, uh, and that military check was sent back to the wives back home. Um, Goods were rationed, gasoline rates uh, were rationed, uh, victory speed was, was 35 miles an hour, there was food books inter introduced by the U.S. government to limit the amount of, of beef and chicken and, and bread that was sold, uh, nylon stockings for women were even uh, used to, to help with parachutes and rubber, uh, scrap metal was valuable, anything that could be used to uh, uh, to help the, the soldiers in the war effort was, was recommended to be turned in and then, and then used for, for those types of uh, practical things. Some states allowed children to go back to work as young as 12 years of age. Six million women took part-time jobs and received less pay, less pay than their, ma their male counterparts. Uh, the work week uh, was expanded from 40 to 48 hours. Anything that big people could do at home to, uh, to protect the United States. And the United States earns this nickname as the arsenal of democracy because a lot of the things that were built uh, not only helped American troops, but also British, French, Canadian, allied troops. We also see Rosie the Riveter signs for the first time. Um, the idea that women were helping to win the war effort by entering into the workforce at home. Uh, major companies like Ford Automobiles uh, switched over and they didn't make automobiles anymore. They made tanks, like it says here, the toughest Fords built ever. By 1944, uh, the automobile plants in Detroit could, could produce one of these every hour. 200,000 American companies turned to wartime production. Um, and so it was really about mobilizing and changing the American workforce. Um, and you see wartime material just soar between airplanes and tanks and ammunition and those types of things. And FDR, one of the things he did do uh, was he wanted to keep uh, things as normal as possible on the, ho on the home front. Um, and so 
He, uh, he, he wrote a green light letter to keep the major leagues playing baseball. Um, and, and in it, he said, I give you the green light to keep playing. Uh, uh, because he thought it would be good for Americans to to be able to listen to something different on the radio or to check the newspaper and, and have something to follow along with instead of just all the, the war updates. Uh, there was a huge number of American troops that uh, um, actually um, – uh, served in the military. Here's a picture of Ted Williams here. Ted Williams was the last Major League Baseball player to hit 400 in a season. Hasn't hasn't happened since he did it. Uh, but he, in the middle of his career, puts his career on hold and uh, picks up and goes all the way to uh, to fight in the war in Europe. He fights in the Battle of the Bulge and gets some some real bad frostbite. That uh, of course he's never the same hitter when he comes back at the at the same time uh, after his war effort. And it's just unique that. Uh, you know, somebody who is you know, one of the best baseball players ever uh, uh, was so patriotic and, and put his career on hold. I don't think you would see that happen with professional athletes here today. And so it really shows how, how uh, the whole country unified uh, behind this war effort uh, to do the best job they could and to, to be as patriotic as they could to help win the war. Okay. And, and 60 percent of major leaguers actually put their career on hold, you know, Ted Williams being probably the best example uh, to actually serve in the military. Um, and so then you had a lot of replacement players. And there's actually a, a really good, a really good movie called The League of Their Own, where uh, women's professional baseball kind of filled that void for a while in the 1940s. So if you get a chance, go check out uh, A League of Their Own with Tom Hanks, because Tom Hanks can't make a bad movie. You know, it's good if he's in it. So hope you learned something here today. Make sure you answer those Ed Puzzle questions and uh, and uh, have a good day.